Hello, I'm James O'Rock, author of Tryptamine Palace, Five Meo DMT and the Sonoran Desert Toad. Uh, I've also got a book coming out this year called The Second Psychedelic Revolution and a book of short stories called Who's Got the Bomb. Uh, it's very exciting what's going on here with the, the toad venom and uh, this country's attempt to integrate it in a useful way. And I think it's extremely interesting and I'm, I'm, I hope I get to return and see more what's going on uh, here in Mexico. 5-MeO-DMT is a psychedelic. Uh, it's an entheogen, which means it's a compound capable of inducing a mystical or spiritual experience. Um, it's a tryptamine, which means it's of the same family of the psychedelics such as LSD and psilocybin and DMT. Um, but it's also of the same family as serotonin, which is a brain hormone, which is the way psychedelics are able to work because they are part of the same family. Well, DMT and 5-MeO-DMT are what I would call cousins. They are both uh, related compounds based around the same five-sided tryptamine and dole ring um, in the simplest form. So they are related the compounds of the same family uh, of, of psychedelics, the same way LSD and psilocybin are, that would be the simple answer. Um, their effects are very different. In my talks, basically, I describe DMT as operating at the sixth chakra. At the sixth chakra, everything that's imaginable is available. All the visions, all the gods, all the goddesses, all the paradises, the palaces, the beauty of, of the entire universe and the horror is visually contained within the sixth chakra with DMT. And this is the place you can meet all the gods, all the goddesses, etc. But there's still a state of separation. There's still the observer and the observed, like this. When you reach the seventh chakra, which is where I believe 5-MeO DMT operates, this separation is removed. The object and the observer become one there's no more separation between anything. And it's actually a, a far less visual experience because it's more an experience of connection, what Stan Groff calls the transpersonal experience. Um, Ramakrishna, the famous Hindu sage, used to be able to describe his ascent of the Kundalini through the chakras, but when he went from the sixth chakra to the seventh chakra, he collapsed because what is at the seventh chakra is in, is in itself inexplicable and untranslatable because it doesn't operate on the same dimension of being that we op we function in now. I believe that the 5MO operates in almost a different dimension of reality, which is where your consciousness is functioning while you're on it. I mean, the most interesting thing for me for 5MO DMT, certainly from my first experience, was experiencing consciousness without identity, that I could actually experience being conscious and being part of a field of consciousness with absolutely no idea who I was, where I was, or where I'd come from. As soon as you start thinking, this is too much, bastante, as you like to say, and as soon as you look for a start, for a beginning, for who am I, the ego reforms very quickly and you're back to ground state. This is actually the end of the experience, as soon as you think, who am I? Uh, DMT is found mostly in plants all around the world. It's actually found in an extraordinary number of plants and trees. Uh, and it's also been discovered endogenously within the human body, which means it's being produced naturally somewhere within our system. 5-MeO DMT is found in a number of plants. Uh, it's also endogenous and most interestingly, of course, it's found in the um, Bufo alvarius or Sonoran Desert Toad's venom which is the only entheogen producing animal uh, we know of on the planet. Well, the difference is simply one's been constructed in a lab laboratory with what you know we call uh, organic chemistry, um, which is where we're able to construct molecules by manipulation um, the 5-MeO DMT found in nature has been created in the laboratory of nature. So it's been created within similar processes within a plant. Or in the, in the case of the Bufo alvarius toad, 
Uh, this particular toad has a um, methylate bufotonin to create 5-MeO-DMT. There are 485 species of bufo toad on the planet. All of them uh, have bufotonin as their venom, except the bufo of Alvarius, which for some completely unknown reason is able to metabolize and methylate uh, bufotonin and change its composition to 5-MeO-DMT. Just makes it particularly unique. Uh, the argument about what's natural and what's lab made is um, a difficult one, I think, because everything's made in nature during through other processes. So whether we do it in a laboratory or nature does it in plants or in toads, there's still a similar catalyzing process going on to create the end product. For example, LSD is often described as being a, a natural, a synthetic drug, because at the time of its creation, we had not yet discovered anything like it in nature. Since this time, we know there are very similar uh, alkaloids to LSD in uh, morning glory seeds here in Mexico, I believe you call it a liliquai. Um, so that's a good example of something that start, that in its most famous form, it's considered synthetic, but in truth, the actual natural form of it also uh, available. Um, DMT, I believe, was created in a lab before it was actually discovered in nature. A lot of these things we create first in the labs and then we realise later that they actually have natural forms. There was a great period of discovery that started in the late 1900s when we really figured out how to manipulate and create new compounds. And this is, this is I actually think, our modern contribution to psychedelic history uh, is that now we're capable of creating very pure versions of these compounds without the use of the natural forms. For example, mescaline was first synthesized in 1895, and that came about after an um, examination of peyote and uh, trying to, to isolate the psychedelic alkaloid that was at work there. So you can, the, you can create, you can get mescaline from cactuses, you get mescaline from San Pedro, peyote, uh, or you can also create it in a lab. No, personally I don't, because we all occupy the same spiritual arena. Uh, well, psychedelics became illegal in the USA mostly because of the fallout of their authorised and regulated use in the late 60s when pretty much all psychedelic compounds were made illegal. 5-MeO-DMT was not actually made illegal at that time because nobody really knew about it. It got made illegal much later as an analogue. Once again, it got made illegal once it was being sold on the internet and there was certain abuses of it that allowed the authorities to make it illegal. Um, I think it was probably more falling into the hands of the inexperienced or young people who you know, experimented with it to the horror of their, of their parents. Um, as far as I know, there aren't really any cases of any mishaps or accidents with 5-MeO-DMT. I do know of a death where somebody drowned in a hot tub, um, and I personally don't think it would be very sensible to smoke 5-MeO-DMT in a hot tub, but it certainly wasn't the fault of the 5-MeO itself. My belief in psychedelics is that they're, they're like microscopes or telescopes. And they're very uh, potent tools for examining the role of the ego and the differentiated, differentiated states of consciousness. Um, a lot of people would like to describe 5-MeO-DMT and ayahuasca as medicines. You hear the word medicine bandied around a lot. I personally don't really see how they are medicines in the normal sense. They don't apply specifically to a disease or they don't take away pain. Um, what they really do is they examine our psyche and to a certain extent they examine our soul. So I would say that if any kind of medicines, they're medicines of the psyche and the soul rather of the body. And that's because they work on examining our consciousness and the way consciousness works, which gives us, gives, gives us different perspectives 
on the, on the world. Uh, medicine, in my mind, is something which treats a specific disease or a specific problem in the body. I think we're attracted to this concept of shamanism and medicines because they fit into our own culture. The idea of the scientist or the idea that there are certain things that we can take that fix things or change things. Whereas I see 5-MeO DMT particularly uh, in a more mystical sense, I would say it's more of a sacrament than a medicine. What do I think about shamans and healers nowadays? Um, I think shaman's one of the most abused words in the Western language at the moment. I think there's a great deal of abuse being done by pseudo shamans, uh, many of whom um, are attached by their egos to the drug that they're giving, and then they create a whole persona around their necessity of being the person that gives this medicine. There are definitely still many traditional shamans around the planet. Uh, I think they would find at the way we use psychedelics somewhat baffling. It's not the way that they really use them. 5-MeO-DMT is an interesting one because as far as I know, there is no evidence of any history of it being used shamanically. We certainly haven't found any. There's a lot of conjecture, there's a lot of possibilities, but at this point, as far as I know, there's nothing that can remotely be used as proof that it was ever used shamanically. That's what I would explain as differentiated states of consciousness, which, for example, practices like meditation have traditionally accessed these different states of mind. I think, for me, the most interesting thing about psychedelics is the effect that they have on the ego. And I've spent most of the last decade, since my own book, Tryptamine Palace, came out, trying to um, integrate my ideas with Eckhart Tolle's ideas on the ego uh, the book The New Earth I think is very useful um, because I think it, it, it explains how there we really occupy two different levels of mind. There is a level of consciousness that's very pointed, and very directed and that gives us our sense of I and this is the, the state of consciousness we occupy most of the time and many people are unaware there are any, any other states of consciousness. But if you are able to disrupt the ego which is the sense of I, uh, then you reveal the, the universal mind or the universal field of consciousness that then rises up, which is a classical mystical experience. So I think for me that's the most interesting and use, use for psychedelics as a tool of experiencing differenti differentiated states of consciousness. So you know that these are real and you know that there's just not one state of consciousness that we constantly occupy. And ultimately for examining how powerful the sense of I is and how much it actually distracts us or separates us from the universal. It's not an ego killer, it's an ego, ego disruptor. What, what all psychedelics do, in my opinion, is they disrupt the, the field of the ego in various degrees of power. Uh, and when you totally disrupt the ego and lose completely your sense of I, that's that's a sense of self, that's when the universal mind rises. And this really, I think, is the classic shamanic experience of the death and rebirth that the shaman goes through. He must die to be born again. And to a certain extent, sense in a psychedelic experience, that's what we go through, the death and then rebirth of the ego. I certainly think it's historically real. I believe the same mystical experience has influenced human beings for thousands of years in different forms. I think it's the root of all religion. I think how real it is is a question that cannot really be answered, uh, perhaps until we die. But most people that experience it certainly find it very real. And it's had a profound effect on my own consciousness and spirituality. Definitely. I think it connects or reveals the universal field of consciousness that connects us all in a very real way. Well, for starters, I really dislike the word drugs. I think the word drugs is a, is a blanket term that gets used to, on many, many different compounds with completely different effects. 
And it's actually a word of control that our governments and our societies use to put all these different compounds in the same baskets. Psychedelics, for example, are completely non-toxic and completely non-addictive. So they don't work in the same way as, say, a drug like cocaine or, or methamphetamine, which are addictive and very you know, physically toxic. So the fact that we, we throw all these different compounds into one basket is, is rather unfortunate. But I think if you look historically at the kind of compounds that have been used uh, at different cultures all around the world, the vast majority of compounds that, that shamans tend to use are psychedelic compounds, and they're generally non-toxic and non-addictive. It's been 12 and a half years since I first experienced 5-MeO-DMT. And when I was first interested, introduced to it, I was looking for it as a curiosity. I wasn't looking at it as a medicine and I wasn't looking for it as a mystical path. 5-MeO-DMT uh, opened the mystical experience up for me and converted me from being a pretty hardcore atheist to a person with a much more spiritual worldview. Um, I think in many places I was just the right guy at the right place at the right time with the right skill set to write my book Tryptamine Palace. In the years since Tryptamine Palace was written, it's taken on a life of its own, for sure. And it's very um, rewarding to see how many people resonate with my descriptions of the experience and my analysis of what the experience is all about. Uh, once again, this word, the use of the word medicine uh, is, is, is toad venom a medicine? I don't think it is in the traditional sense. I think it's an instrument to examine consciousness and it's a medicine of the psyche and the soul. Um, I understand why psychedelics are very useful for breaking addictions because I think most addicts uh, have a place in their soul that is empty. There is a, there is a pointlessness in their existence, a darkness that they can't fill, so they use addictive substances to constantly try and fill this hole that's inside them. Psychedelics blow that all open. They shine a really bright light on your soul and they're one of the best ways to break these addictive cycles because they're working on the psyche, they're not working on the body. They're not trying to change the physical addiction patterns of the body, they're changing the mental addiction patterns of your mind, which is why I think they are a class of their own. Um, I think it's very interesting if you look at the relationship between these various compounds, these various drugs and toxicity. Um, I once proposed that we create a scale based on ranking compounds uh, by the effect they have on the ego. I call this the IROC mystical scale. And at the top of the scale we have 5-MeO, DMT and DMT which disrupt the ego the most effectively. And we have LSD psilocybin, mescaline, you basically go down through the psychedelics and then you start into the empathogens and you have marijuana, I think, and then there's a point what I call the overdose line and you go over this line and you start to get into the compounds like methamphetamine, alcohol, cocaine. Now as these go down they increase the effect on the ego. I think cocaine is one of the ultimate ego drugs a whole bunch of people standing around going, me, 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 not listening to each other. And very much a drug that suited the very ego-driven 80s. You know, the whole persona of cocaine is a very, look at me, 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 me drug. Alcohol is such a potent ego reinforcer. People get in fights over what, some idea that they think is important while they're drunk. It shows you how much it inflates the sense of ego. So what's really interesting about the scale of drugs, compounds, is there's a direct relationship to toxicity. If you take the drugs, the compounds at the top, they're the least toxic. 5-MeO-DMT and DMT are endogenous, which means they're being produced by our own body, so they're clearly not toxic. LSD is one of the least toxic things known to man, because there's so little of it that operates on the body. As you go down that list, the, drug, the compounds get steadily more and more and more toxic cocaine, alcohol and methamphetamine being the most toxic and the most addictive of them. 
So our body is telling us what we need and what we want and what we like, as is nature. Psychedelics work very well with the human system. They're not addictive, they don't leave a trace. Our brain literally eats them up and they're gone. And there is a relationship between our brain and nature and these certain compounds that's clear there's a biofeedback loop going on here in nature. And it's not even in a psychedelic level. Uh, De Dennis McKenna talks about the fact that we need to eat green plants to get the, the chemicals that create the neurotransmitters that allow consciousness to exist. So already we're in a biofeedback loop with nature. We need to consume green plants to create the neurotransmitters that allows consciousness to exist. Psychedelics in plants and in the toad venom is just a more complex relationship of the same biofeedback loop that's going on with nature. Nature to a certain extent informs us through these compounds, I believe. There is definitely a small percentage of people that have an extremely negative and powerful reaction to 5-MeO-DMT. Powerful enough that it can be, require hospitalization, can require that you have to be medicated, and it can also even lead, in very rare cases, to suicide. Um, my personal belief is the people who have the bad trips, and I've only ever seen a couple of these, is because they've been unable to let go. They haven't been able to, exp to allow this death of the ego and the subsequent rebirth. They, they hang on and they get dragged through hell. Um, there's a very potent book called Darkness Shining Wild by a gentleman called Robert Augustus Masters. That's his uh, more than decade long experience post 5 MEO DMT. And he was extremely traumatized. So I do think 5 MEO DMT should be approached with a great deal of caution. Um, it's not like any other drug, it really does not even belong in any of the categories of any of the compounds, even LSD and DMT do not really operate in the same field as 5-methoxy-DMT, except perhaps in extremely large doses. Uh, so, you know, it's not, you cannot underestimate its potential potency or how much it might change your life. Is it for everyone? You know, I think psychedelics find you and, you and you find them. So if you're on that path and it's, it's there, then that's probably for you. How much that's a synchronicity, how much you push that, that perhaps affects these things. Um, like I said, I think it's best not to be seeking and not to be looking in a lot of ways. There's definitely more than a decade into this now, I see a great deal more seekers people that are looking for something, um, which I think it's a little hard sometimes to find it when you're looking for it. But so, uh, you know, it's a difficult question. I don't like telling people that they shouldn't do it, but the one or two times where I felt strongly that someone shouldn't do it and I was overridden, both of those people had extremely negative experiences. So I think there's a certain amount of uh, instinct involved and if you are you know, you see a lot of people go through a proselytizing stage. They smoke 5 meo DMT or they do ayahuasca and they want to give it to everybody. They want to give it to the whole world. In some ways you should work through that phase yourself and see where you're at before you start to become another neo-shaman. And I find it's really interesting that so many people immediately get on this bandwagon that they want to give it to everybody. You know, I'm a mystic at heart and mystics are generally interested in their, their own personal relationship with God and not much else. And I, I think that's something that separates perhaps 5-MeO from say ayahuasca or DMT or other things is, is it's a very personal path. And uh, like for example, I prefer to do it alone. It's difficult for me to do it in a room full of other people because my ego latches onto the energies and egos of the fields around me. And when I do it by myself, I don't have to deal with any of that. I'm just able to lie in the experience more. So I would say, you know, it's a very personal thing. And not, I don't see the need to try and give it to the whole world. But I think there's a, a lot of the world that could use it.